Okay, um, this is a lecture for Soldier's Home. Um, unfortunately, this is going to have to be the way that you're going to be viewing the video. It's really dumb, but um, my phone is um, it's charging right now, so I'm having to hold it because otherwise it's going to turn off. So, all right. Um, all right, well, before we get into Soldier's Home, just a couple of notes on it. Uh, remember... Um, you know, we got to remember, keep in, um, keep in mind that um, Hemingway, uh, you know, did spend some time um, in the Italian army, and um, contextual, uh, contextually speaking, um, this might be. Um, this might be a big influence on uh, sort of his time when he was uh, when he was away um, uh, fighting or enlisted with the Italian army as a paramedic. So um, again, we have to keep in mind he's uh, very minimalistic uh, in his style and language. Um, you know, uh, because he economizes his language very much, it's very important that. Um, that we realize that whatever it is that he does write is going to be very important to the story. Um, so that's going to be very important. <clears throat> um, and at this time, again, one of the major themes that you know might present itself later on is uh, the issue with post-traumatic stress syndrome. There was no diagnosis for post-traumatic stress back then, so... Um, so a lot of, you know, the studies that we now have were barely, you know, uh, at it in its, in its advent, you know, during, during that time. Uh, so things like post-traumatic stress weren't called post-traumatic stress. They were called shell shock. Um, so that's, uh, another thing, um, getting some messages. Uh, so he returns from the war and, uh, you know, the major character here is uh, Harold Krebs. Um, and it starts and I guess we'll, we'll start real quick here. Um, um, Krebs went to the war from a Methodist college in Kansas. Uh, and it starts out with a scene of a picture. There is a picture which shows him among his fraternity, um, all of them wearing exactly the same height and style collar. He enlisted in the Marines in 1917 and did not return to the United States until the 2nd Division returned from the Rhine in the summer of 1919. So he was gone for two years. He didn't come back immediately after the war. Um, there's a picture which shows him on the Rhine with two German girls and, other, and another corporal. Krebs and the corporal look too big for the uniforms. The German girls are not beautiful. The Rhine does not show in the picture. So the Rhine is... Um, the um, the river basin in in Germany that they're talking about, and it's uh, if you you know Google it, it it's uh, I don't know if I can turn this thing around. Oh, I was going to show you, but um, it's, it's really nice landscape. It doesn't appear on the picture. He's also saying that the women, the two girls, it's sort of. It's kind of bleak, you know. the The women are not are not beautiful. It's not a very it's not picturesque. <clears throat> and again, he comes home um, after they've already had the celebration for the soldiers. So one of the things that you may want to ask yourself is, well, where, where, where was he all this time for the two years? Um, by the time Krebs returns to his hometown in Oklahoma, the greetings of heroes was all over. He came back much too late. The men from the town had been drafted, who had been drafted, had all been welcomed elaborately on their return. There had been a great deal of hysteria. Now the reaction had set in. People, people seemed to think it was rather ridiculous for Krebs to be getting back so late, years after the war was over. All right. So, you know, if we had to infer about Krebs before and after the war, we have to look at. Um, that very first passage of the very first paragraph in the soldier's home 
he went to a Methodist college in Kansas, so that's going to be very important, right? He went to a religious college. He chose to go to a religious college before the war. Um, and then it also says that it shows him with his fraternity brothers. So he had friends before as well. And um, he enlisted in the Marines in 1977, didn't return. So again, you know, before he went to the war, we might have an impression just with his first uh, with this first paragraph about how he was before and maybe when he gets back. Um, so, um, third paragraph in Soldier's Home, he's talking about, uh, uh, what is he talking about here? The town. His town had heard too many atrocity stories to be thrilled about actualities. Kreb found out that to be listened to at all, he had to lie. Okay, so one of the things that Krebs does and one of the things that's mentioned in the story is this um this ability of of him to to lie and and kind of glorify um glorify the the war um with his lies and you know um so what he does is that he at times also uh he lies about the war but he also assumes somebody else's um heroism he finds out that he gets kind of nauseous when he has to start talking about it more than once and um, and doesn't feel comfortable at all kind of telling these stories. And the other thing is a lot of people, when they listen to his stories, don't actually aren't aren't actually amused by it. So, you know, why does he do this? What is it that, you know, that he lies? <clears throat> um, again, this is something, you know, he tries to glorify and and uh, coming back to you know uh, Hemingway's um, allusions we, we mentioned that he uh, alludes to the Bible and he alludes to uh, Greek mythology uh, and I think uh, it's important to point out um, some of the discussion that we had last time with Hemingway when we talked about how um, how he sees because of the war um, romanticism is dead um, the war has changed. Um, there is no honor. There is no code. Um, so again, that's where you see the influence here. Maybe in when he's 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 telling the lies, uh, and, and you know that part of him kind of getting nauseous and, and him sort of being sickened by it is, uh, you know, you could attribute it to that same to that same reason. You know, the, the no no honor system anymore. Um, Again, uh, all is fair in love and war. Um, he says his lights, his lies were quite unimportant lies, um, and consisted in, and consisted in attributing to himself things other men had seen, done, or heard. Um, had seen or uh, done or uh, or heard of, and stating as fact certain um, apocryphal incidents familiar to all soldiers. Even his lies were not sensational at the pool room. His acquaintance who had heard detailed accounts of German women found chained to machine guns uh, in the Argonne forest and who could not comprehend or were barred by their patriotism were uh, from interest in any German machine gunners who were not chained, were not thrilled by his stories. Right. And again, he says, Krebs acquired the nausea in regard to experience that is the result of untruth or exaggeration. Um, one of the lines I think um, I think was important here and, and it's right right below this here he says he fell into the easy pose of the old soldier among other soldiers other soldiers that he had been badly sickenly frightened all the time in this way he lost everything so whenever he starts talking about these stories in some way again we, you you know we have to keep in mind that that post-traumatic kind of stress, maybe um, uh, assuming uh, assuming some part of, of him when he's talking about these stories, right? Even though they are lies, even though he's sort of he's sort of making up stories that other you know other men kind of lived, it's sickening, you know. And part of this is his alienation that he feels because of what maybe he saw at the war, but also. Um, you know, just the whole attitude of war itself that he might be feeling. Um, so, um, so again, moving on. Um, 
we there there is a little bit of um, of information here on Krebs and, and how he was before the war. Um, before Krebs went away to the war, he had never been allowed to drive the family motor car. His father was in the real estate business and always wanted the car to be at his command when he required it to take clients out to the country show to show them a piece of farm property. So there's very there's very little information that we get or, or um, you know his his dad isn't talked about a lot in in the in the story um and um so when he was when he was home in other words before the war he wasn't allowed to use a car later on you'll find out that he was that his that his mom is sort of telling him, go use a car get out of here do something um outside of that you know his father's very minimal um he's a minor character within the whole thing um, he d doesn't come out. He doesn't really. Um, there is no dialogue that we can see from from his father. Mostly, everything from here on out is narrated, or is uh, is Krebs talking, or his mom talking, or his little sister talking. All right. Um, so we find out that nothing's really changed in the town. He says nothing's changed um, in the town except that the young girls had grown up. But they lived in such a complicated world of already defined alliances and shifting feuds that Krebs did not feel the energy or the courage to break into it. He said he liked to look at them, uh, though there were so many good-looking young girls, most of them had their hair cut short. When he went away, only little girls wore their hair like that or girls that were fast. Uh, they all wore sweaters and shirts. Uh, so he's talking about kind of the style, I guess, from that time. They all wore sweaters and a shirt waist and round Dutch collars. It was a pattern. He liked to look at them um, from the front porch as they walked to the other side of the street. He liked to watch them walking under the shade of the trees. Uh, he liked the round Dutch collars above their sweaters. He liked their silk stockings. He liked their bobbed hair and the way that they walked. So it's sort of, I mean, kind of creepy, right? Like this part, like if he's stalking them or something like that. But notice the repetition in he liked, he liked, he liked, he liked, right? He liked to look at them. And Hemingway, it's no, it's no accident that he uses repetition a lot in, in, his, um, um, in his work. And here we have a clear example, and we'll have some more that I'll point out in a little bit. But um, in a sense, you know, there is, there's something to be said about the repetition and he liked and he liked and he liked. Uh, and again, it's, um, to some extent, um, you know, to some extent, it, it's sort of, again, we talked about, well, how do, how is it that we start to rebuild, um, uh, how do, how do, you know, if, if language is dead, if there is no God, if there is, um, you know, if, if there is no honor, there is no code, then how do we begin to reestablish these things? And to some extent, Hemingway does this um, by doing certain things in his work. And one of the things that we talked about in um, in Indian Camp and um, the end of something is fishing and how important fishing is. In Indian Camp, it's sort of spiritual, you know, at the end with the imagery, it's like it's a spiritualization and it's... Um, it's metaphoric in, in talking about uh, spirituality and the cycle of life, etc. And the fish is a symbolic kind of allusion to the Bible and, and God. Um, the other thing in the end of something is when he's fishing with, um, with Marjorie. And they're fishing and it's supposed to be, and again for Hemingway that's... Um, it's important fishing is, is is a very it's sort of a spiritual thing in itself too you know and if you're going to do it you need to make sure that you do it right right and um by that point in in uh, the end of something he sort of marjorie has sort of outgrown him already in that aspect right so with language he tries to resurrect the same idea with language whenever he does repetition so you know, think about um, think about incantations, or uh, you know, an incantation is like um, sort of you know you, you sort of whenever you think about maybe um, 
witches incantations and and uh, spells and stuff like that it's it's trying to 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 sum up something it's trying to um, incite uh, something with language so again you know the repetition sort of acts as as an incantation to uh, to a resurrection of some of, of something right so whenever you see that think about that all right he liked he liked uh, the round saw so again it's inciting something but it's it's supposed to and it's gonna have something to do with whatever it is that Hemingway is talking about all right um, so then uh, right after that he's talking about what the things that he liked then he starts talking about things he didn't like and in this portion he's talking about girls right so um, when he was in, in town there um, when he was in town their appeal to him was not very strong. He did not like them when he saw them in the Greek's ice cream parlor. He did not want them uh, themselves, really. Uh, they were too complicated. There was something else. Vaguely, he wanted a girl, but he did not want to have to work together. He would like to have had a girl, but he did not want to have to spend time with uh, long getting, getting with her. He didn't want, want to get into the intrigue and the politics. He did not want to have to do any, any courting. He did not want to tell any more lies. It wasn't worth it, right? So again, I mean, you know, this alienation, you, you can see it in the way that, you know, he bega he, he behaves um, not only with, you know, later on with his mom, but sort of this inner conflict that he has within himself. And again, conflict will be important if you're going to be uh, talking about, um, the second prompt that we have where you're talking about the five elements in fiction um, and, and the inner conflict, the man versus himself type of conflict that's happening and it's occurring within um, within Krebs and, 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 and his psyche. Um, so, you know, uh, again, you know, this, this, whole, this whole part is sort of him and his relationship with, you know, with women. Um, um, have them all the time that he could not go to sleep without them. Um, oh, it says, then a fellow boasted that he could not get along without girls, uh, that he had to uh, have them all the time, that he could not go to sleep without them. It's sort of the, you can't live with them, you can't live without them, right, type of, uh, um, you know, um, I guess message or whatever that, that oftentimes accompanies um, relationships and you know and and the way you know men and women sort of uh, uh, operate right um, after that he says this again and this is again important to um, language is very going to be very important in Hemingway and reading um, and and what it sort of reads into he says uh, or it says that was all a lie it was all a lie both ways you did not need a girl unless you, you thought about them. He learned that in the army. The sooner or later, you always got one. When you were really ripe for a girl, you always got one. You did not have to think about it. Sooner or later, it would come. He had learned that in the army. Right. Uh, now he would have liked a girl if uh, she had come to him and not wanted to talk. But here at home, it was all too complicated. He knew he could never get through it all again. It was not worth the trouble. That was the thing about French girls and German girls. There was not all this talking. You could talk and you could talk much and you did not need to talk. It was simple and you were friends. He thought about France and then he began think, to think about Germany on the whole. He had liked Germany better. He did not want to leave Germany. He did not want to come home. Still, he had to come home. He sat on the front porch. So that question about where he was all this time for the two for the two years you sort of get a glimpse here in this particular passage right talks about how you like germany instead of france well it would have took some time for you to you know be out there and really discover how girls were like um you know unless you spent some time some significant time there so um so again you know he's he's talking about how he didn't want to leave and he didn't want to come home uh, but yet he's, you know, he's back. Um, he liked the girls that were talking along um, the other side of the street. So he's, again, there's a brief flashback to, uh, and again, that's figurative language working there. There's a brief flashback that he's, that he's, um, that he's talking about with going 
with being in Germany and, and, and coming back or whatever. Um, and then, and then again, the uh, perspective changes back to the present. He had liked the girls that were walking along the other side of the street. He had liked to look at them much better than the French girls or the German girls, but uh, the world they were in was not the world he was in. He would like to have one of them, but it was not worth it. They were such nice pattern. He liked the pattern. It was exciting, but he would not go through all the talking. He did not want one badly enough. He liked to look at them all through. I was not, uh, it was not worth it. Uh, not now when things were getting good again. Really short, you know. Look at those, you know, those lines, very minimalistic. And if we're talking about um, uh, something, that, um, you know, we're talking about composition and, and sort of the simple way that you can just write a sentence and it doesn't, and you can be minimalist in what you're writing. But again, if you take this Hemingway approach, this sort of iceberg theory kind of approach, there is a lot that can, that, that can, um, a lot of subtle things that can come from, from, you know, short passages. Um, and, and what I like to, what I like to say and what I like to tell, you know, certain students that have hard time, um, 